Uh, we talk about being on an Advent journey uh, every year, and this year it really feels like we've been on a journey uh, from downstairs to upstairs, so it's great to be back in the, the worship center, uh, having getting, gotten, getting, man, my English is just going down the drain this morning, uh, everything repaired, so uh, thank you for your patience last week uh, when we did church downstairs. Um, I don't know, a lot of people pulled me aside and said it felt very cozy, and so uh, that was nice, although I, I joked with people, it just the room feels new today uh, when I got in, and warm, so that was, uh, that was another plus factor. So uh, We are on a Advent uh, journey. Uh, hopefully, as Brenda mentioned, you are joining in with us uh, online on some of the stuff that's there. There's a special tab on our website called Advent. And if you go on there, um, there's some weekly devotionals uh, uh, podcast form that are on there that have been really interesting. And then there is a daily devotional that you can go through. And even if you know we're a third of the way or a quarter of the way through Advent so far, jump in where we are today. It's always good to, to just um, take some time this season and kind of get ourselves prepared uh, for, for Christmas and for uh, Jesus' coming. And, and, you know, there's so much chaos in the world around us right now. Uh, you know, Christmas has become so uh, busy and so commercialized that sometimes it's good just to step back for a moment and, and kind of catch our breath on what's going on. And that's uh, one of the things that we've been doing uh, here uh, since last week. We've kind of stepped back for a moment to catch our breath and remind ourselves of the, the Christmas story that we read every year uh, when we light the, the Advent wreath and we read through the book of Luke. Uh, last year, or last week, we opened up looking at the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth and how uh, the angel came to them, to Zechariah while he was in the temple, um, to tell him that they were about to, to have a baby, uh, John, John the Baptist. And they were, uh, Zechariah was amazed because of his age. Um, and the angel, when he looked at the angel and said, you know, I'm old. And the angel said, well, you're not going to talk until the baby comes. And um, this tremendous miracle happens in their, in their life. Um, last week was all about this, this thing of God's promises being fulfilled. And, and some of that is what the Christmas season is about, God's promises being fulfilled. And we, we talked last week about the three elements that always seem to happen when God is about to fulfill his promises. It usually speaks to something in our lives that we already anticipate or always already desire. And, and Zachariah and Elizabeth, they desired a child. And so that desire was in their heart. They just thought it was impossible. Uh, secondly, it, it, it's usually something bigger than, they, than we can imagine. They just wanted a baby. Instead, they were going to get a prophet. And, and finally, it's usually something only God can do. And, and that's the final piece that we tend to meet, miss. When God's about to do something, when he's about to fulfill a promise that, that's in our lives, it's usually something that only he can do, that we can't do on our own. And we're going to really see that today as we move on to the next part of the story, which is also in Luke chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 1, all today. If not, it should be on the screen as well. We're going to look at the story of Mary. Now, Mary is an interesting character in the church. Uh, within the church, universal, there are different views on Mary. Uh, some denominations really focus on Mary. Others just don't at all. They want to kind of push her aside. Um, but, but in reality, when we look through the Bible, there's not a whole lot about Mary in there. Luke gives us probably the most information. There's a little bit in some of the other Gospels, some towards the end. But the picture of Mary that Luke gives us is quite interesting. And it starts in, in verse 26. The story begins, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Now, we've heard this story a million times, and because of that, it's probably lost some meaning to us. The story should sound 
oddly familiar to last week's story, right? An angel comes, is going to proclaim a miraculous birth. But there's some major differences between the two stories. Uh, the first is the backgrounds of our main characters. If you remember, Zachariah and Elizabeth, uh, they, they had a pedigree. They were priests. Uh, they, they, came down, they, were, they came down through the line of, of, of Aaron. They were righteous, it was said, in the sight of God. They observed all of the Lord's commands and decrees. They were found blameless. And as we look at the background of these people, we look at them and say, these are worthy people. They deserve to have God move in their lives. We can empathize with them with the idea that they could not have children. And for some of us, our hearts would break for them. And we see what the Lord is going to do, and we say, yeah, the Lord should do that. They're worthy of that. But Mary, on the other hand, Mary has no pedigree of her own. Instead, she's the furthest away from a pedigree that, that we can find from her. We, we know very little about her, other than uh, she's from Nazareth uh, of Galilee. That, that's like the redneck of, of Israel. That's a backwater town. They talked funny. They had a weird accent. Uh, second, um, she's a virgin. Now, now, for us, we have an idea of what virgin means, and it did mean that back then, too. Uh, but it had a secondary meaning as well. It meant that she was extremely young. Uh, scholars think that she was probably 13 or 14 years old when this occurs. Uh, in that time period, that's marrying age, by the way. And so we look at her, and, and if you step back for a moment and start thinking about her social class, She's a young, unmarried woman who, who technically would, would still be under her father's household control. We know that she's pledged or engaged to Joseph. Uh, we know his lineage, but we, we have no idea what hers is. None whatsoever. Lineage is important in this time period. It's very important. But we don't know anything about hers. So to the world... She's insignificant. She's unimportant. She's a nobody. She's a nobody. And that's what makes the angel's greeting to her so odd. Verse 28. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered, what kind of greeting might this be? Highly favored favored in God's eyes. This is Luke's great, great contradiction. What is worthless in the eyes of the world is highly worthy, highly favored in the eyes of God. And that's what brings on Mary's confusion, because she, she's like, what are you talking about, highly favored? See, looks to us, in many ways, can be very deceiving. What, what, what the world wants to honor is not always what God wants to honor. What the world uh, puts favor on is not always what God wants to put favor on. And what the world looks down upon, many times, is what God looks favorably upon. Now, Gabriel came, comes with a message, and it's a similar message to last week, remember? Remember? He says this to her in verse 30. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. This is a tremendous honor. She knows what this means, okay? Uh, the concept of a Messiah, who the Messiah will be, is, is not unknown to the people. They know what they're expecting. They know what they're waiting for. And so this is a tremendous honor 
for such an insignificant person in the eyes of the community around her. And so Mary, being confused on why is this honor coming to me, because it would make sense if you're going to, to, to have a Messiah, it, it should come from some tremendous lineage, right? Someone who is great, someone who is honored, someone who the world looks at some great political leader, or some great military leader, or someone. Not some young girl from an out-of-the-way, backwater place. So, like Zechariah, Mary has a question. Verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Now, we know from earlier today that, that the angel, Gabriel, is going to explain to her exactly how it's going to be and what's going to happen. But Zechariah questioned the angel as well. Remember last week? He questioned the angel. And he ends up losing his voice. But Mary doesn't. So what's the difference here between her question and Zechariah's question? Well, the difference is from where the question comes from. Notice Zechariah's question in verse 18. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. How can I be sure? This question is coming from a place of unbelief. Lord, you want me to believe that you're going to do this. How can I be sure that you're actually going to accomplish the things that you say you want to do? What can you do to prove it to me? Now, now compare that question to Mary's in verse 34. How will this be since I'm a virgin? This isn't coming from a place of unbelief, but a place of belief. This is coming from a reality check. Mary's looking at her circumstances and realizing that she can't do this on her own. Remember who she is, her state in life. And remember that she probably knows a little bit of where babies come from. How will this be? What do I need to do? All of this seems beyond anything that she can do on her own. It isn't that what happens to us sometimes when the Lord comes. It just seems beyond anything that we can do on our own. God promises something. He, he puts dreams into our lives that are a bit overwhelming. How can we accomplish that? All of this is just too much for her. But it's not too much for God. And so, God, so Mary just simply asks, how will this And we see the angel is more than willing to explain. Verse 35, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. This isn't about anything that she has to do. This is all about what the Holy Spirit wants to do in her. Asking God how he's going to accomplish something is not, a pro not the problem. The problem is when we begin to doubt that God can do what he says he wants to do. Sometimes we think that, 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 that we're unable to question God, that it's wrong, that we need to have some kind of blind faith in everything we're doing. And here we see Mary questioning God on how he's going to do something. I, I think we get confused on what faith is. Faith isn't just blindly believing things. Faith is believing that God can do what he says he's going to do. For no word from God will ever fail. See, and I think that leads us to the most important lesson 
from today's text. You see, I think when Luke wrote this, he wanted us to get two things out of it. First, God can use anyone he wants. Anyone he wants to choose. He didn't choose someone politically powerful or rich or someone great. He can choose anyone. He, he chose the lowly girl from an out-of-the-way place. He chose a no one. And, and, though, uh, and through that, there's, there's something incredibly relevant for us to grasp. If he can use Mary, he can use you. If he can use Mary, he can use us. For, for none of us in this room are great in the eyes of the world. None of us have tremendous power or wealth that I know of. You haven't shared that with me. And, and, and let's be honest. We live in a truly out-of-the-way place. Yet it's not our pedigree that impresses God. It's our willingness to trust Him. It's our willingness to trust Him. And that brings us to the second thing. What's important to God is not what we've done or who we are or what we even bring to the table. What's important to God is how we respond. Notice Mary's final response to the angel. Verse 38, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. How many of us are willing to make a statement like that to God? We, we say that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, Savior, but being our Lord and Savior means that He's our Lord over every aspect of our life. Over everything. But we become fearful. We see our own weaknesses, our own shortcomings, and we decide that God cannot or could not or should not use us. That, 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 yeah, God can do anything, but He ain't going to do this. We decide, for some reason, that the Lord is Lord over some parts of our life, but not over everything. And we find ourselves responding to Him more like Zechariah than we do like Mary. Prove to me, God, that you're going to do this. Now, I want a reality check here for a moment. Mary knew there was going to be a cost. She didn't just like think, oh, God's going to impregnate me. Life is going to be great. i got to imagine she knew there would be a cost to this. Virgins don't miraculously, or normally don't miraculously get pregnant. I, I mean, can you imagine her father? I try to imagine this. If one of my daughters came up to me and said... I had a, an angel came to me, and I'm pregnant. I don't know if I'd have the faith for that one. Matthew tells us that Joseph was trying to figure out a way to like divorce her and kick her off to the side. She knew there'd be a cost. That people would talk behind her back. That she would get a reputation. But she was willing to pay that price because God called her to it. Because God said that He was going to do something miraculous through that. Over and over again in the Bible, we see that God loves to choose the weak, the outcast, the disenfranchised, to do His will. I mean, look at the story of Moses. He's an orphan found in a basket, raised in Pharaoh's house, tries to do something on his own, and ends up getting exiled to ten sheep. To an Egyptian, a shepherd is like the lowest of the low. Eighty years later, after his birth, God shows up in a burning bush. You want to be in an out-of-the-way place. You're taking care of sheep in the middle of nowhere. God used him. I love the story of Joseph. 
the promise, the dreams that he had, that God's going to do something tremendous through him, and it irritates his brother so much that, that they do what brothers do and decide to kill him. But wait, wait, I gotta, let's not kill him. Let's make some money off of him. We can sell him as a slave. Man, that's, that's being really brotherly. He ends up in, 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 as a slave, and the Lord seems to be with him, and things are growing, and then he's falsely accused and ends up in jail. And then God shows up, and he interprets dreams for people who are in Pharaoh's presence, and he's thinking, this is my way out, and they forget about him. Just forget about him. God didn't. I love the story of Gideon, right? That great judge, that great warrior who is uh, so afraid of the attacking Pharisees that he tries to um, tries to uh, shift the wheat in a, in a wine press. He's hiding in a wine press so that no one will notice him. Or David. David was sought so highly of that his dad left him at home when the prophet came. The prophet said, I want one of your sons. Oh, great, here are my sons. Wait, there's one missing. Oh, yeah, you just don't. Just David. Don't worry about David. Or the apostles. The apostles are great. It's like the three stooges, all of them. They, 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 they just can't help but get in their, in their own way and stumble and fall and do dumb things. And then, this, you know, the group that Jesus chooses, wow. Talk about 12 being on the same page or not being on the same page. Fishermen, tax collectors, zealots who want to kill tax collectors. It's a great group. Or Paul. You know, I think I'm going to grow the church by finding the one guy who wants to kill us all and empower him. God doesn't choose the people we think he should choose. We look back and we see these people through the lens of history. But God sees people through the lens of, of their potential and the lens of their faith. So the question is really simple today. How will you respond to God? God's calling each one of us to something. It's His desire to allow us to partner with Him in something that He's doing to expand His kingdom. And, and, and there are two questions. First, do you believe that God can actually use someone like you? Do you believe that? And second, how will you respond? Our response begins with living out our lives like we actually believe that Jesus is Lord. We, we talk a lot about forgiveness, and that's important. But, but reality, following Jesus is all about His Lordship. The early church, the first creed, the first statement of faith was simple. Jesus is Lord. And for them it meant over everything. That Jesus was Lord, not Caesar. And so they looked at it as Jesus was not only Lord of their lives, but Lord of their families, Lord of their marriages, Lord of their finances, Lord of their sexuality, Lord of everything. Lord of everything. And so that's where it starts with us today. For, for many of us, we, we look at the cross for forgiveness, but we really haven't invited Jesus to be Lord in our lives. And so I think it's important 
today of all days, just to start right there. For many of us, we've been coming to church for years, but we've never actually taken the moment and, and just invited Jesus to be Lord. To be Lord of our lives. So I want to do something today for a moment before we, we go into ministry time. I just want to invite you, if you've never asked Jesus to be Lord over the entirety of your life, I want to invite you to do it today. And I want to do it in a way that may be a bit uncomfortable, but I think it's important. I'm going to ask you to stand if, if, that's, if you're asking him for the first time. Because I think there's something important physically responding. And second of all, I, I want to give you the opportunity to circle the date. I have a date in my life. I know where it is where I decided to ask Jesus to be Lord. I, I went to church. I grew up in the church. But I have a date, Labor Day, 1988, where I made a decision to take it from just showing up at church and going through the motions to actually asking Jesus to be Lord over every aspect of my life. And I think it's important that we have that date. So I want to just invite you, if, if you just sense the Lord, if you're sitting there going, I've been going through the motions and no one has asked me, has invited me, has told me, ask Jesus as Lord in my life, I want to just invite you today just to, to stand and we'll say a prayer and invite Jesus as Lord. And if you're with someone today and you're freaking out about that, just squeeze their hand a bit and invite them to stand with you. I'll pray. Pray with me. Jesus, I invite you into my life and I ask you to be Lord over every aspect of my life. Lord, I give you my coming and my going. I give you everything. Let your kingdom come now into my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for, for standing. Um, we're going to do ministry in a few minutes. And if you want to come up for prayer, please do. Um, I'd love to pray for you personally. For the rest of us, and even for the challenge to us today is, is simple. Do we believe that God is going to do what He said He's going to do? Can we respond like Mary? Lord, I'm Your servant. May it be to me as You have said. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We thank you that you love to use those who the world has discarded. That you love to move even in out of the way places. Now, Lord, as we continue this Advent journey, Lord, begin to speak into our hearts. Lord, begin to show us the areas that we're holding back.
And Lord, give us the courage to say yes to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus. I want to invite um, Brenda and Jeff up this morning just to take a few moments. And we're going to ask the Lord what he wants to do.